Welcome to Real Paranormal Activity, the network. Entertainment you'll enjoy. You are listening to an RPA production where people gather. Foss Corporation, LLC. Hello, Mysterians. Welcome back to Terry's Mysterious Moments. I am your presenter, Terry from Texas. For this episode of Terry's Mysterious Moments, we are going to go back in time. First to the early days of World War One also known as the Great War, also known as the War to End All Wars, which it didn't. And we're going to travel up north to visit our neighbors to the north, the Canadians. Second story, we're going to go back to the 60s. In a day when a lot of people acted like zombies, we're going to talk about a real one. So let's get started. One of the most curious events in Canada's history occurred on Valentine's Day night, Sunday, February 14th of 1915, six months after the start of the Great War, or World War I. At roughly 10.30 p.m., the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Borden, received an urgent telephone call from Mayor Donaldson of Brockville informing him that at least three German airplanes had crossed the St. Lawrence River from Morristown, New York. The invaders, apparently seen by scores of Brockville citizens who were returning from Sunday evening church services, had just passed directly over the community, traveling in a northerly direction, presumably towards the capital. One of the planes shone a powerful searchlight on the town, lighting up its main street. Reportedly, the planes dropped fireballs or light balls into the river on the Canadian side of the border. Many Brockville citizens came unglued and went bat guano goofy. After receiving the mayor's call, Borden immediately contacted the Canadian militia. Meanwhile, Brockville's chief of police telephoned Colonel Percy Sherwood, commissioner of the Dominion Police, regarding the air invaders. At 11.15, Sherwood ordered Parliament Hill to be blacked out to avoid giving the raiders an easy target. Since Canadians are exaggeratedly known to be friendly, but not incredibly stupid. Nobody calls them that. This was a smart move. While the phlegmatic commissioner was not unduly apprehensive about the report of approaching enemy planes, he believed it was expedient to take precautionary measures, including blacking out key government buildings. That made sense. The lights that illuminated the center block's Victoria Tower when Parliament was in session were extinguished. The Royal Mint, which also typically was lit up at night, was similarly darkened. At Rideau Hall, home of the Governor General, the blinds were drawn. Although the Governor General was away inspecting troops in Winnipeg, his wife, the Duchess of Connaught, was in residence. Other buildings observed the blackout as news of the impending attack hit the streets. The Globe newspaper reported that the entire city of Ottawa was in darkness that night. Despite Ottawa being only about 63 miles from Brockville as the crow flies, aviation experts told the Canadian authorities that It might take until midnight for the invaders to make their way to the capital, owing to poor weather conditions, which included low clouds and rain. 
Remember that planes at that time were much more pokey and slower than our modern jets. Smith Falls, Perth, and Kemptville, which were on the expected flight path, were alerted and told to keep a sharp lookout. But the clock ticked and midnight came and went without any sign of the intruders. The next day, newspapers were full of stories on the expected, but never happened, air raid. The Globe's headline screamed, Ottawa in darkness awaits aeroplane raid. Several aeroplanes made a raid into the Dominion of Canada. In the streets of the capital, citizens experienced a wave of excitement with the war apparently being brought to the city. The Ottawa Journal reported that Ottawa feels first thrill of the war and marveled that usually reserved Ottawa citizens were stopping complete strangers on the street seeking news of the invaders. In the House of Commons, Sir Wilfrid Laurier rose and asked the Prime Minister for any information that he might be able to provide. Borden confirmed that he had received a telephone call from the mayor of Brockville and that he had communicated the news of the expected raid to the chief of the general staff, but he was unable to give the point of departure of the aeroplanes in question. That night, fearing that the previous night's attack might have been aborted owing to bad weather and subsequently relaunched, government buildings were blacked out for a second night. Parliament sat as usual, but behind drawn curtains. For two hours, Ottawa City Council debated a motion submitted by St. George Ward Alderman Cunningham that in view of the possibility of an air raid on the City Hall while this august body is in session, Constable McMullen be instructed to pull down the blinds. Really? They had to discuss it in Parliament? The Ottawa Journal wryly noted that the debate occurred under the glare of 61 electric lights which lit up the building. It also noted that the alderman frequently absented himself from the debate to climb the city hall tower to scan the skies for sight of the approaching planes so that he could be the first to warn his colleagues to take shelter in the cellar. When no planes appeared, people started to look for other explanations. Quickly, suspicion focused on some Morristown youths, described as village cut-ups, who admitted to having sent up three fireworks balloons from the American side of the St. Lawrence at about 9 p.m., which exploded in the air above Brockville. Giving credence to this story, the remains of balloons with firework attachments were subsequently recovered from the ice on the St. Lawrence, two miles east of the town, as well as from the grounds of the Brockville Asylum, now called the Brockville Mental Health Center. The ostensible reason for sending up the balloons was to commemorate the centenary of the end of the War of 1812. More likely, it was a prank aimed at just scaring the Canadians. Officials in Ottawa didn't re readily believe these reports, though. The Dominion Observatory reported that the wind that night was consistently coming from the east. It contended that as Morristown is directly opposite Brockville, and I'm assuming by opposite they mean south of Brockville, any balloons sent up from the Morristown area would have traveled to the west, and certainly not in the direction the airplanes were said to have taken. The press also reported that militia authorities were in contact with Washington and that a thorough inquiry had been set in motion to locate the airplane's base of operations. Across the Atlantic in England, which had experienced its first German Zeppelin air raid just three weeks prior to this, the Phantom Air Raid on Ottawa was a source of merriment. 
By chance, the night after the Ottawa scare, the lights of Parliament at Westminster suddenly went out. Making a reference to the Ottawa Raiders, William Crooks, who was the Labour MP for Woolwich, cheekily called out in the darkness, Hello, they're here! A House of Commons cracked up with laughter. So what really happened on that Valentine's Day night? How plausible was an attack on Ottawa? It wouldn't have been the first time that armed raiders crossed the U.S. border into Canada. There were precedents. Less than 50 years earlier, the Fenians, an Irish extremist group, made a number of military forays into Canada across the U.S. border. The Ottawa Journal also claimed that German sympathizers in the United States had contemplated action against Canada during the early days of the war in 1914, going so far as to set up training bases in the United States with the objective of making a descent upon Canada to destroy canals and railways before being told to desist by the U.S. authorities. Less than two weeks prior to the supposed air raid on Ottawa, Werner Horn, a German Army Reserve Lieutenant, tried to blow up the Vanceboro International Bridge between St. Croix, New Brunswick, and Vanceboro, Maine, in an attempt to disrupt troop movements. However, an air raid on Ottawa by German sympathizers seems highly unlikely. While on a sharp upward development trajectory, aviation was still primitive in early 1915, the first powered flight having taken place only 11 years earlier. Even at the front in France, airplanes were then used mostly for reconnaissance. Typical of that era, the British military plane, the BE-2C, could stay aloft for only three hours. The most likely explanation is the toy balloon story, combined with a bad case of war jitters. As suggested by one of the newspapers, the searchlight beam that reportedly lit up Brockville could be explained by a fortuitous flash of lightning while the balloons were above the city. However, the fact that the Dominion Observatory was adamant in its view on the wind direction that night fueled fears that the bombers were real. Certain modern-day investigators have a whole different explanation. UFOs, or as we think of it in today's speak, UAPs. The story of Ottawa's Phantom Air Raid was featured in a number of books on the paranormal, including The Canadian UFO Report, The Best Cases Revealed. To add grist to the paranormal mills, the same night Ottawa prepared for the air raid, strange lights and planes were apparently spotted over other Ontario towns. Thus the question remains. What was seen over Brockville that night so long ago? Was it simply a balloon prank taken too seriously? Was it actual airborne raiders from an enemy combatant nation? Or was it a visitation from outer space? I'm sure we may never know. Now we move in time back up to the 1960s. In this day and age, it's not too unusual to hear the term zombie thrown about. There have been movies about zombies for decades, and TV shows about zombies have been wildly popular lately. But the question remains, do zombies really exist? The answer may shock you. The story of Clairvius Narcisse, the real zombie case, may be a story that's familiar to you in the periphery of your mind and memories, 
But Clairvius Narcisse was born in 1922 and lived until 1994, was a Haitian man who claimed to have been turned into a zombie by a Haitian voodoo practitioner and forced to work as a slave on an island plantation. The hypothesis for Narcisse's account was that he had been administered a combination of psychoactive substances, often the paralyzing pufferfish venom tetrodotoxin and the strong delirium datura. Datura is one of those things that's sometimes used in Southwest Native American medicine practices for things like vision quests. The combination of these drugs rendered him helpless and seemingly dead. The greatest proponent of this possibility was Wade Davis, a graduate student in ethnobotany at Harvard University, who published two popular books based on his travels and ideas during and immediately following his graduate training. However, Subsequent examinations using tools of analytical chemistry alongside critical review of earlier reports have failed to support the presence of the key active compounds in the supposed zombie preparation, which was central to the phenomenon and mechanism supported by Davis. Narcisse admitted himself to the Schweitzer Hospital, operated by an American medical staff, in Deschapelle, Haiti, on April 30th of 1962. He had a fever and fatigue and was spitting up blood. Doctors could find no explanation for his symptoms, which gradually grew worse until he appeared to die three days later. He was pronounced dead and held in cold storage for about a day before burial. Eighteen years later, in 1980, a man identifying himself as Clairvius Narcisse approached Angelina Narcisse in the city of Leicester, convincing her and several other villagers of his identity by using a childhood nickname and sharing intimate family information. He claimed that he had been conscious but paralyzed during his supposed death and burial and had subsequently been removed from his grave and forced to work at a sugar plantation. Per his account, after his apparent death and subsequent burial on May 2nd of 1962, his coffin was exhumed and he was given a paste possibly made from Datura, which at certain doses has a hallucinogenic effect and can cause memory loss. The Bokor, which is a male practitioner of voodoo, who recovered him then, as stated, reportedly forced him alongside others to work on a sugar plantation until the master's death two years later. When the Bokor died and regular doses of the hallucinogen ceased, Narcisse eventually regained his sanity and returned to his family after another 16 years. Narcisse was immediately recognized by the villagers and his family when he told them the story of how he was dug up from his grave and enslaved. The villagers were surprised, but they accepted his story because they believed his experience resulted from the power of voodoo magic. He was seen as the man who was once a zombie. It has been further argued that Narcisse had broken one of the traditional behavioral codes by abandoning his children and was made into a zombie as a punishment. When questioned, Narcisse told investigators that the sorcerer involved had taken his soul. The instigator of the poisoning was alleged to be Clairvius's brother, with whom Clairvius had quarreled over land and inheritance. He only returned home once he heard of his brother's death. This case puzzled many doctors because 
Narcisse's death was documented and verified by the testimonies of two American doctors. The case of Narcisse was argued to be the first verifiable example of the transformation of an individual into a zombie. Narcisse's story intrigued Haitian psychiatrist Lamarck Doyon. Though dismissing supernatural explanations, Doyon believed that there was some degree of truth to tales of zombies, and he had been studying such accounts for decades. Suspecting zombies were somehow drugged and then revived, Doyon reached out to colleagues in America. Davis traveled to Haiti, where he obtained samples of powders purportedly used to create zombies. Based on the presumption that tetrodotoxin and related toxins are not always fatal, but at near lethal doses can leave a person in a state of near death for several days with the person remaining conscious, tetrodotoxin has been alleged to turn human beings into zombies and has been suggested as an ingredient in Haitian voodoo preparations. The idea appeared in print as early as the 1938 non-fiction book Tell My Horse by Zora Neale Hurston, which reported multiple accounts of purported tetrodotoxin poisoning in Haiti by a Bokor. The concept was subsequently popularized in the 1980s by ethnobotanist Wade Davis. However, subsequent research has discredited the tetrodotoxin zombie hypothesis by using analytical chemistry-based tests of multiple preparations and review of earlier reports. After serious anthropological investigations of zombie stories in various cultures, including Narcisse and a handful of others, Reports appeared that Narcisse received a dose of a chemical mixture containing tetrodotoxin and bufotoxin, which is a toad toxin, to induce a coma that mimicked the appearance of death. He was then allowed to return to his home where he collapsed, died, and was buried. The Canadian ethnobotanist Wade Davis, who did research related to the implication that, that tetrodotoxin was present, hypothesized how this might have been done. The Bokor would have given Narcisse a powder containing the toxin through a braided skin. Narcisse would then have fallen into a comatose state, closely resembling death, which resulted in his live burial. His body would have then been recovered and he would have been given doses of Datura stramonium to create a compliant zombie-like state and set to work on the plantation. After two years, the plantation owner died and Narcisse would have simply walked away to his freedom after the final dosings cleared out of his system. While in these popular accounts and in Haiti, tetrodotoxin is thought to have been used in voodoo preparations in so-called zombie poisons Subsequent careful analysis has repeatedly called these accounts and early analytical studies into question on technical grounds. Moreover, they have failed to identify the toxin in any such preparation, such that discussion of the matter of tetrodotoxin use in this way has all but disappeared from the primary literature since the early 1990s. Kao and Yasumoto concluded in the first of their papers in 1986 and remained unswerving on the matter in their later work that the widely circulated claim that the lay press to the effect that tetrodotoxin is one of the causal agents in a zombification process is in their view without factual foundation. Kao of the State University of New York on interview on the matter in 1988 stated, I actually feel this is an issue of fraud in science. A supporter of Wade, Bo Holmstead of the Karolinska Institute, more restrained, stated that it was not deliberated fraud 
rather than it was withholding negative data and therefore simply bad science. Davis responded formally to the charges, arguing the variability of the preparations as cause for cow's inability to find the toxin in any of them and possible ineptitude in dissolving the toxin by the otherwise admittedly expert cow and speculating on the presence of other ingredients in the preparations to enable transport across the blood-brain barrier, thus providing the needed reduction of three orders of magnitude of the amount needed to result in the claimed effects, arguing that only when the bocor causes others to believe the victim is dead and then revived do his efforts become apparent, and that only a single success would be sufficient to support the cultural belief in the phenomenon. As of 1990, his critics were unpersuaded and no literature to support the original contentions has yet appeared as of 2015, though lively popular description, especially on the web, continues. Narcissus' story was loosely adapted into a movie, The Serpent and the Rainbow, in 1988 an American horror film directed by Wes Craven. Zombie Child, a 2019 French drama film, was also inspired by this story. So we have the question, do zombies really exist? If so, are they the shuffling in some instances, running in others, mindless eaters of brains we see in the movies? Or are they the docile, obviously drugged laborers as presented in the Narcisse case? I'll let you decide for yourselves. Well, that's what I've got for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the stories. They were interesting to look up and and research. I had no idea that there had been fears of a cross-Atlantic German bombing run on anybody. Uh even a supposition of the same. And I've heard of the Narcisse case for years. I found it it was interesting to to read again, to study on, and I hope you had fun with them. Well, again, that's all I have for this week, and catch us next week on Terry's Mysterious Moments, or next time on Terry's Mysterious Moments, where we'll have more interesting stories for you. You folks be safe. Have a great week. Bye-bye.